Okay, everybody. Good cheese. Yik aya. A hoot ye tee. Kawujin has a tee. Yahana. Koka ha dis aya. You do a sock ye dis link it enough. Koa. Tled ha enough. We shook we shook cut koo disi aya. A Native American Heritage Month. A joy had to us a goo. Ewa kaha tu yik eko nakaya ha in sati ah. Ya shawo denei, Dr. Michael Yellowbird. Has the ane kakaya yi jitune ya ak kwan, gun cheese, and yet kusani we ak kwan kuu. Ye ane kakaya ha tu was a goo. Yik e at the data ya yu kakatutla ati. Welcome everybody to the evening at Egan, the virtual series. And happy Native American Heritage Month. Uh, we would say Shukat Kuudisi here in Kukahadis, which is the uh, animal scratching around month. Uh, we are very pleased to start um, this next three series, which are honoring Native American Heritage Month, uh, with a tremendous scholar who's going to spend some time with us here, Dr. Michael Yellowbird. Uh, I have seen him talk a number of times and I'm always just, it gets the wheels really spinning about different things and different approaches uh, to language revitalization, indigenous excellence, uh, a number of different things. Uh, so welcome on behalf of the University of Alaska Southeast and we live and work and I reside upon the land of the Akkwan people, the people of the Little Lake. And we're very grateful to the noble people who host us here on their land. Uh, I will introduce Dr. Michael Yellowbird. He's a citizen of the three affiliated tribes, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara nations, and grew up on the Fort Berthold Reservation in White Shield, North Dakota. His work on mindfulness and neuro-decolonization are important pillars to language revitalization, equity, health and wellness, and overcoming historical traumas. He works with tribal and indigenous peoples to bring mindfulness and neuro-decolonization approaches to communities for the purposes of healing and improving wellness. Dr. Yellowbird uses neuroscience research to examine how mindfulness approaches and traditional indigenous contemplative practices can train the mind and positively change the structure and function of the brain. His work seeks to translate the neuroscience of mindfulness and de de neuro decolonization to tribal and indigenous communities so they can understand why and how mindfulness and indigenous contemplative practices work. He is the author of numerous scholarly articles and book chapters and the co-author of four books, For Indigenous Eyes Only, The Decolonization Handbook, For Indigenous Minds Only, uh, A Decolonization Handbook, Indigenous social work around the world towards culturally relevant education and practice and decolonizing social work. Uh, he is currently the Dean and Professor Faculty of Social Work at the University of Manitoba. Uh, I'm very happy that we have a chance to listen to him and there'll be some time I believe for question and answer afterwards. So please help me welcome Dr. Michael Yellowbird. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank, thank you, Lance. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm so pleased to, to be able to uh, present you know, some of my work uh, this evening to everyone. And I got distracted a bit by, um, by the, uh, you know, the uh, election. So uh, it came on, came on kind of uh, you know, a, a little late, but uh, um, I, I wanna let you know that I'm, I'm actually um, uh, presenting from uh, Treaty One territory in Manitoba, which is the land of the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, the Cree, OJ Cree, the um, Dene people, and, and uh, the, um, the uh, Métis, Métis people. So I'm a visitor in this land and I'm, I'm really glad to be here. So um, uh, Lance, how much, how much time are we planning? Uh, speakers typically yeah. go about 50 minutes to an hour, and then we do about 20, 30 minutes of okay. 
question of words. So, okay. So I want to. I'm just going to pull up my my uh, presentation here, and um, get us started, and uh, kind of talk about my work as I go through. But this is um, primarily uh, the work that I'm doing these days around neuro decolonization, and 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 uh, as Lance was saying, I, I do a lot of work in regard to uh, trying to figure out, you know, how these practices of indigenous people, um, you know, ha, um, uh, in the past, you know, what, what benefits they had, and then sort of moving forward into the present time, why they're still relevant today. And, and um, I use, I look at traditional indigenous knowledge and science, as well as Western science. So this first uh, slide is my oldest daughter, uh, Arundhati Dirohuka, uh, Yellowbird. She, uh, she's our oldest girl. And um, this was taken probably about three years ago in uh, Fargo when I lived in North Dakota before I moved to Canada. And um, as you can see that she's practicing meditation. And I, I wanted to, again, um, kind of demystify meditation that, you know, it's not something that just came from the East, but it's something that all people all across the world have engaged in, you know, contemplative practices, quieting the mind, settling the mind down and focusing on, you know, something and any activity and um, not getting distracted by thoughts or getting distracted by outside, you know, um, uh, information or um, um, stimulation, that sort of thing. So um, it, what happens, of course, uh, when people engage in, in uh, meditation practice, which is uh, secular, meaning it's not, it's not religious, but it's just like training the mind, a lot of good things happen to the brain. So um, I have uh, four daughters, four grown sons and then four little daughters. And um, all of them have learned how to meditate as, uh, as, as they've grown up. So um, um, I, wanted, I have a lot of slides. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about how um, decolonizing the mind and cleansing the body is, is so important you know, for us to have good health, whether it's you know, um, uh, maintaining our culture, our language, uh, returning to a healthy lifestyle. It's all really based based upon the experiences and perceptions we have of trauma, of well-being, and how they change the brain's structure and function. And that's what the uh, science calls neuroplasticity. Neuro meaning the, the nerve cells in your brain, and plasticity meaning that it, the brain's like plastic. It, kind of, it can change anytime it gets new information, new language, new thoughts, new experiences. And also, um, neurodecolonization is about how our environment either triggers or silences our gene expression. And that's what is known today as epigenetics. And uh, again, how thoughts, how laughter, how trauma, how silence, how um, prayer, all and you know, movement, all these things can really um, um, uh, change our genetic expression. Um, Neurodecolonization is also about, you know, we have all these brain regions and, and um, what I'm gonna, do is, is uh, you know, look, talk about some brain regions tonight, you know, how they're so universal for people, for all of us, and how the brain gets activated when we do different kinds of things, and how brain waves and, and uh, you know, changed and uh, shaped, and then we've got all these kind of specialized uh, brain cells. I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I'll just, you know, I'll leave that kind of uh, maybe for some questions. Uh, also, I won't talk much about neurotransmitters and modulators, but I do a lot of work in that area. But also even you know the food that we eat, how it how it affects how we feel, how it yeah, it can um, increase our vulnerability to to trauma or or to um, um, anxiety and depression, but how uh, traditional ancestral diets um, based upon genetic factors actually insulate us from those kinds of things. So there's many different kinds of things that are going on you know in the body and in, in the gut and the brain. So. Um, what I want to do is um, kind of move quickly to how I frame my work. And what I do is I use um, a medicine wheel. You, you may have seen that. A lot of folks um, talk about medicine wheels. And um, let's see here if I can get this to kind of close down a little bit here. Um, a lot of people uh, use a medicine wheel to kind of conceptualize how um, you know health is, but I think it's really interesting because as we look all across, you know, the world, and especially in this part of the hemisphere, we see that you know um, there are symbols, 
of well-being that are etched in rocks and stone in on, in the ground, you know, uh, on the sides of hills and mountains. And and uh, as we as we sort of go through uh, what we call Turtle Island in North America, we find symbols of of um, um, those um, markers that of, of our ancestors have been here, and how our ancestors have moved back and forth, back and forth, all across you know uh, Turtle Island, all through the um, the uh, Western Hemisphere, all the way out to the Polynesia and those areas. There's good evidence to show that some of us have markers from that area, from the Pacific Rim, um, all the way up to you know where you are in Alaska, all the way to the Arctic Circle, all the way down to Terra de Fuga in, in South America. So uh, many of us, although we, we see ourselves differently now, uh, that we, you know, um, it's, it's been fairly determined that we come from maybe uh, four mothers, right, indigenous mothers, that you know um, that um, we all kind of are, have uh, common ancestry to. So um, some of us are more related to one another than other groups, but you know there are still these markers that show uh, we're related. Um, so the medicine wheel, uh, just for um, um, clarity, um, is you know the sacred hoop, right? Symbol of harmony, balance, and peaceful interaction among all these living beings on Earth, and. Um, the medicine wheels represent, you know, these four cycles of life, and and the whole system. If you get back up here, our brain, our genes, our microbes, all these different things uh, are all, you know, uh, shaped by the relationship we had with our environment uh, and other, you know, a relationship with one another, our relationship with our past history and our present, right? And these are what I try to contain in the medicine wheel. All these di sacred directions that you see here are pretty common among a lot of people in the world. And of course, um, what the medicine wheel represents in terms of these really sacred elements, right? Air, water, fire, earth, and so on. And then there are all these uh, connecting points to mother earth or to the sea or to the mountains or you know, to the sky. So uh, indigenous people have those um, kind of connections that they talk about quite a bit. So um, let's see, sorry. So this is kind of what the medicine wheel looks like on Turtle Island. So there's an ancient medicine wheel um, in, in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. It's about 10,000 plus years old. So if you were to kind of be above this in a drone, you, you could see, um, you know, this medicine wheel here that, you know, 10,000 years, it's sort of been in this area for a long time. But what, what we do know is that a lot of tribes from all over came and occupied this area, you know, camp down here, and then they find, um, you know, the remains of their campsites and all these different kinds of things. Um, so this place here, kind of at the edge of this cliff here, uh, area was called, you know, the place where the eagles cry, right? Because there was a lot of eagles that were around this area and a lot of the uh, indigenous people kind of seen those as spirits or as, you know, messengers and so on. Um, if you go to, to there, you'll, you'll see that, you know, a lot of native people leave different things there, like these dream catchers, they leave prayer offerings and, um, you know, prayer flags, there, this is sort of what it looks like now. But also, you know, if we think about it, we're related to a lot of other different indigenous cultures. So if you look at Buddhist, you, this is like in Tibet, you know, if you look at um, you know, this, you, you can see that, uh, you know, color and prayers and those things have been very important to indigenous people, right, for a long period of time. And uh, these are things that, again, help generate a, a relationship between people because the earth, the sky, the waters, the airs, those kinds of things are, are very fundamental to us as, as indigenous people. This is a, um, a sun dance. If you've ever been to a sun dance, um, these are kind of happen, you know, and um, all over really now in Turtle Island, different places are uh, whole sun dances. But here you see in the trees, uh, these uh, sacred uh, um, prayer flags, you know, with tobacco in them that people have tied up. What's interesting about, you know, this, I, I was a sun dancer for many years, What's interesting about, about these um, uh, flags is that a lot of people um, put tobacco in there and prayers in there. So they're, they're not just praying for themselves or their family. Now, of course, they, they do do that, but they pray, pray for the world, just like, you know, when you go back and, and look at the, um, the Buddhists, you know, these prayers are for the world. They're not for individuals. They're prayers for good things for the world, for balance in the world. And then if you see that, very similar, right? So these ideas that we're ancient cultures, we have a connection to the land, we've marked the land with sacred sites. Um, these are things that are still fundamental to us. And they, they predate you know, all Christianity and all other forms of religion and belief systems that um, 
came here after um, Europeans came here. So I'm not saying that's right, good or bad or anything. I'm not making a judgment. I'm just saying that these religions have been, uh, you know, ancient and, and these spiritual beliefs have been around for a long time. So we see that, you know, in different places. This is in North Dakota. Someone built a replica of the medicine wheel uh, at Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. There, there was also a medicine wheel built by the students. This used to be a residential school or a boarding school at one time. So if you, if you look at it here, you'll see that, you know, this is a, a water bird, you know, uh, Southern tribes influence, you know, from uh, the United States. And uh, you'll see that, you know, there's this mark by the, the North and the South coming in from the East. And this is the West side here. And you'll see a lot of, um, you know, people going out there to either just tour the medicine wheel or to pray or to leave offerings or whatever. But it's, uh, you know, something that, you know, we see kind of happening uh, around, you know, been happening for a while, right? Um, this is Judicula Rock, and this is in Callaway, North Carolina. And, and um, Callaway, North Carolina is a place where the, uh, the uh, Cherokee, um, North Carolina Cherokee are. So I was invited down there um, a few years ago to uh, talk with elders about some of the work that I do. And then I wanted to hear, you know, about, you know, what they're doing with their people around healing and around, you know, preventing substance abuse by using traditional methods, by preserving language and culture, all those kinds of things. So what was interesting to me is they, they took me out here, showed me this big rock. We talked about it and they said, you know, it's been around a long time. And then uh, of course, when I sat down and I started looking at, you know, the history of it, you'll see that this rock has been around since the late archaic period over 3000 years ago. And so what symbols do you see? And some of the first symbol that I saw when I looked at was this, it was this um, person here, this, you know, being here with maybe this child, you know, and they're kind of on their way up in this journey, right? And there's this journey going and they have these different things they encounter along the way, little stops that they have as they go up or go somewhere, you know, as they make this journey. And you'll see that, you know, these are people on a journey places, you know, of course, there's sacred, you know, other beings that are there. And these, this, these weren't just made by the North Carolina Cherokee. 3,000 years ago, they weren't the Cherokee at all. That was all, you know, di very different. So the, um, what I was told by the elders and by the uh, people that studied this rock is that these uh, symbols are symbols that come from many different tribal nations from all over Turtle Island moving, you know. So they're 10,000 years ago, they were doing a medicine wheel over in Wyoming. Now on the Eastern seaboard, you know, in North Carolina, uh, Cherokee territory, there's this Judicula rock. So you can see all the symbols there. One of the things I noticed about it was this here, the medicine wheel. And when I ask people, what does it look like? Most people will say, well, it looks like a turtle, right? So in reference to, you know, North America, it's like Turtle Island for a lot of tribes. So that story about, you know, Turtle Island has been around for, you know, at least 3000 years. Um, in, the, in the symbolic marking. Um, again, th these things are all kind of like messages that I've been talking about. They're messages about, you know, when we decipher them, they're messages about people, about journeying, about connections to different kinds of things, uh, you know, mystical, sacred things, sometimes everyday kinds of things, all left by different tribes over a period of 3,000 years. We see the same thing as we get down to different parts of the country. You know, um, this is in Utah. You see this kind of medicine wheel there. And Hopi, you'll see these uh, carvings there as well uh, on the rock, these petroglyphs. And the Mojave Desert, you see the sun sign. So people, are, you know, these ancient folks, our, our ancestors are leaving these, you know, markings all over. This is my reservation here where you uh, see uh, Fort Berthold. The Mandan, Hidatsa, Rikara nations, that's, you know, who, who we are. And on the side of this um, hill here is another big medicine wheel that was made by some young people back in the 90s, early 90s. I was one of those young people that kind of helped uh, put this together after a Sundance ceremony. Um, here's some more out in the desert. You know, these are some medicine wheels out there. I don't know how ancient these are, but uh, someone said, you know, this looks like a whale you know, with a medicine wheel at the tail, you know, I have no idea. Um, and I'm not sure we all really know, but you know what it is. So the medicine wheel then is kind of been ancient. It's, it's been ancient. It's an ancient symbol, right? And I use it to kind of begin to understand, you know, what is neurodecolonization? What does that mean in terms of decolonizing our minds for better health, 
for to retain our language, you know, to recover from trauma, those kinds of things. And, you know, how does mindfulness, you know, play into it and what does it do for our community health? So as I look at that, I, you know, the work is kind of on this idea that there is um, this model called the medicine wheel and a lot of indigenous peoples and cultures have symbols, right? We have round drums we use, you know, a lot of things are circular, you know, um, stories are circular, all kinds of things. So when we look at, you know, our culture, all of our cultures and the experiences we've had and, the, and these, all these perceptions that we have of the world, they really then we begin to understand that they shape, shape our brain's ability to change the plasticity, right? Um, and if we have a good experiences, we have a positive cultural experience and our perceptions of the world are friendly, then we're gonna have good changes in our brain, right? If our culture has kind of been threatened, if our experiences are negative and our perceptions of the world are, you know, it's an unfriendly place, you know, our, the plasticity of the way our brain works then is gonna be changed, you know, uh, to a way that it's detrimental to us. Um, and our experiences also affect our human microbiome. And what I mean by that, the, the micro means small, the biome is the life, biome kind of means life, it's the small life, the meta, you know, the, um, the uh, microbial life that exists on all of us, right? I mean, um, uh, that's, that was very, very clear at one time before we start taking all the showers and using all the shampoos and stuff. You know, um, um, we, our bodies were filled with certain kinds of bacteria, and many of it was healthy bacteria. Our, 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 our noses and our mouths and our guts and our hair, you know, had certain kinds of bacteria, you know, that were, were served as protective to us, right? Um, and, and so, you know, that's something, you know, we've kind of lost in, in, in our colonization. Um, you know, and, and, and Lance mentioned language, right? Uh, the microbiome has its own language. These small microbes communicate, you know, with one another through chemi chemical and electrical uh, uh, communications. And they even, they even talk, talk to our brain based upon the kind of food that we eat, the kind of you know, whether we fast or whether we're eating so many meals a day and so on, how much we're eating. Um, the culture experiences, they also change the expression of our genes, as I said earlier. And, uh, so on, uh, you mentioned that already. So, so uh, I, I look at the model and said, how do we heal and transform from the diseases of colonization and trauma? Well, um, my work now is, is focused primarily on rediscovering ancestral knowledge and practices. What are those things? You know, well, first of all, you know, our brain's ability to change the plasticity, our human microbiome, and our genetic inheritance, what we got from our ancestors, all these things with, that we have you know, uh, right now as, as indigenous people, you know, um, are, are, are called on to be balanced. And, and I, 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 look, I look a lot at the research, I look at history, and um, I, I find that, you know, for a lot of us that have particular genetic markers, you know, and our people have been in the place for a long time, you know, it's it, the, the return to traditional practices is so important, right? And, and uh, many of those are, are very uh, form, uh, simple. Very, very simple, right? Uh, movement, like running or movement or swimming or walking, whatever it is, uh, can, uh, and then sleep. We don't, you know, we've underestimated how important sleep is. Living in the Western world, we don't sleep enough. Laughter and humor. There's, I'll talk a little bit about some of that research there. And collectivism, being together in groups. And now it's a really difficult time to not to, to have that sort of uh, collectivist group, you know, interaction because of COVID-19, this pandemic. Um, our ancestors fasted a lot and uh, there are reasons for that. I just got off a call today with uh, um, a scholar down in Brazil who is uh, Quechua and we, we had this long discussion about obesity and hypertension and depression and um, um, eating disorders with indigenous people way down there in, in um, Brazil and uh, they're, how they're affected by diabetes, especially by obesity and, and uh, depression and those kinds of things. And we talked about fasting, how fa uh, fasting our ancestors used to fast. That's kind of a, it's a lost uh, practice. It's a lost art really, because uh, we don't do that. You know, we, we, can, we can eat almost any time we want, you know, even if we don't have, you know, uh, uh, the right food, we can, we can eat junk food, that kind of thing. So, you know, we, we have to, uh, you know, again, these are things that you know, I'll talk a little bit more about. 
contemplative practice like mindfulness and, um, you know, whatever you bring mindfulness in uh, to your, your life, you know, you're sitting, you're focusing and you're uh, um, working on uh, creating a, a greater awareness and, and concentration. And uh, also adaptive stress routines. I'll talk a bit about that. Circadian rhythms that go along with sleep, you know, how does that work? And then of course, being outside, uh, we spend a lot of time inside. Our, our bodies have been colonized by the work that we do. And, and now with COVID-19, in some, in some cases we're colonized by not being able to go outside either. So colonization is, is um, about this in my work. I talk about invasion, the unwelcome intrusion into our lives. It could be Western ideas, it could be COVID-19, it could be diabetes, for example, right? Um, different ways we get colonized. Let's say, for example, um, we, you know, we talk about invasion in terms of COVID-19. You know, COVID-19 shows up and, and we get a period of contamination when we, we have harmful contact or interactions with others. And pretty soon, you know, after it, um, uh, it's in our body for a while, you know, it mutates and of course, then it becomes active uh, infection and uh, our, over, our immune system gets overwhelmed and death or sickness sets in, right? Some people have uh, some uh, type O blood or if you're, you know, have high levels of vitamin D and C in your body and you're, you know, healthy and active and so on, you know, won't, won't uh, uh, suffer too much from that. Other people, you know, um, um, doesn't necessarily have to be old. It could be people with compromised immune systems. The people that get it and, and survive uh, then are colonized and, and the virus will probably stay in us forever just like chicken pox does. Years later, we get shingles or like, um, you know, a number of different viruses that we catch, you know, um, from different sources that colonize and it stays with us. So the same thing happens with ideas and belief systems. Um, I use, a lot of times I use um, the, uh, sugar in our lives, you know, to talk about how um, bringing foods to our communities, you know, we didn't eat a lot of sugar. It was very rare. And so as, as you know, um, we started eating more products with, you know, refined carbohydrates and sugar. Uh, we we um, started, you know, getting our bodies contaminated. And pretty soon uh, the infection or our, our, our pancreas was overwhelmed and we ended up with diabetes. So unless we are able to kind of reverse our diabetes by returning to an ancestral way of life, then we get colonized by diabetes. And what I mean by that is that, you know, uh, Western society then provides for us um, insulin. So we don't have to change our diet so that we stay, we stay colonized by the diabetes. So a lot, all this, you know, all leads to like um, um, even ideas or beliefs or values or practices, you know, from colonization become part of our lives. And in the end, those of us who survive are no longer overwhelmed and we can function and thrive within the colonial state. And, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we don't move away from that state, we stay there. Um, and some people live on the margins of that. They don't, they don't do well in a colonized uh, situation. So decolonization is about this um, as we begin to try to heal ourselves, right? So there's a cleansing period that happens. So we wanna strip away the harmful invasive thoughts, practices, beliefs, the values that were imposed by these colonizing structures and, evolu and, uh, and through evolutionary mismatches, but I'll, over here, I'll talk about that in just a second, that you know, um, we, want, we wanna stop doing those practices that are harmful to us, right? Like uh, ruminating about trauma or eating bad food or um, speaking mostly English and not speaking our language, right? We wanna strip away those kinds of things that were imposed on us. We want to return to that. We want to, in the Renaissance period, you know, it's like the recovery period, right? The recovery, the Renaissance, you know, uh, um, um, it's like, you know, we're, we're recovering, or we're growing, right? It's restoration. It's restoration about the different cultural practices, beliefs, and the values that we have. Uh, we had uh, one time that were abandoned, we, we abandoned them, or they were taken away through colonization, but as, as you'll see that, you know, a lot of these things are very relevant to us today and necessary for our survival and well-being, especially in the time of pandemics, climate change, um, you know, those things are happening very quickly. The, the final period of decolonization is the enlightenment um, phase where now, you know, this is, it. we're kind of in the period of enlightenment because we're using a new technology to have this presentation. We're using Zoom technology you know, to uh, help advance and empower our knowledge about decolonization, neurodecolonization, 
So it's it's like you know we we try to you know use they say a hybrid use Western ideas and indigenous ideas bring those together and figure out how they can you know help help the people out. So this is kind of the decolonization uh, model. Um, let me just kind of go on to this part of the medicine wheel because I want to you know make sure that we get some time for to talk about this. But this first part of the medicine wheel is about decolonizing the mind. And as I mentioned, the neuroplasticity is how does the mind and the brain change and grow. And neurogenesis is about the growth part. Neuro meaning our, our cells and genesis mean, you know, the growth or, the, you know, the beginning or the, the um, you know, the, um, the uh, expression of more brain cells and then healing, right? These are, these are not new things to any of us as human beings and to indigenous people. We changed our minds all the time, you know, and our brains were changed and we learned new languages new customs, met new people, or new ideas, or idea, new ideas or belief systems came into the village or the tribe or among the people. It's happening all the time. Um, and also uh, you get you know, good ideas, bad ideas can change the way your, your, your brain works. Neurogenesis, you know, uh, brains constantly were uh, growing as kids. Some things can make them uh, grow even more. And these are kind of traditional practices that you can grow more brain cells, which is very important. And um, I, I talk about that in terms of the traditional um, uh, contemplative healing practices. Um, what are they? Well, I have identified, you know, in the research that I'm doing now that I'm kind of focusing on 12. There's maybe I'll focus on a few more, but there, there are 12 mindfulness practices that can heal our emotions, reset our genetic expression, facilitate improved learning, and so on, you know, I mean, and, and um, address, you know, trauma, right? Um, what are they? Again, these are things that you know we probably don't think about much. That that these are critical factors, mindfulness factors that help us, you know, to to retain language, culture, to improve our you know, physical, emotional, spiritual well-being. And it's running, or movement, you know, swimming, anything that you know is an uh, aerobic exercise, uh, dancing, you know, and singing. I'll show you some really interesting research from that. Sleep is very important, as I said before. Laughter and humor, collectivism, being together in group, intermittent fasting or fasting, meditation, adaptive stress. Then we're looking at, you know, um, how do we challenge our body? And I'll get into that a bit more, you know, by taking hot saunas or doing a sweat lodge or sitting in really cold, ice, icy water or being in the cold. You know, what does it do? It produces something called heat shock proteins. I'll, and I'll talk about that in just a second, of course, being outside. So if we... Um, if we look at, you know, um, the effects of running, for example, I mean, you could do walking, quick walking, or you could do swimming, or you could be working or whatever it is, whatever gets your heart rate out and moving. But I, I talk about running because most of us, all humans evolved to run and move. And whether, you know, if we ran, we're running down animals or running, you know, playing games or running away from, you know, um, danger, you know, we, we, we evolved to run. And our bodies have been so colonized that we, we, don't, we rarely do that much anymore. We don't spend a lot of time outside, you know, running and moving. Um, this idea of persistence running is in our heritage. Persistence running is really an evolutionary concept about how our ancestors used to run on empty stomachs for a long time to run down, or let's say a rabbit or a deer or our food, right? Um, and all of us did that at one time, you know, no matter where we lived. And then we slowly kind of got acclimated to a certain place. So, you know, during the summer periods or during the fall or whatever, we may have been running down animals, you know, to supplement our diet to get the, uh, uh, the, the protein that we needed, you know, for some of the protein, the B12 and some of the vitamin D that we needed. So, um, you know, we don't do that, you know, to, to uh, get our meals anymore. We don't run after our meals. We go to the store, we go stop by the subway or whatever, and pick up a sandwich, whatever. And that's had a big cost on us. And as you'll see, we go down um, uh, what that cost was. Uh, it not only does it improve our physical health, um, it also improves our mental health. How does it do that? Well, our brain's working memory, how, how, we, you know, um, um, you know, how we remember things, you know, short-term, long-term memory, and how we process memories and how we process problems really um, um, is enhanced by movement, right? Uh, some of the, what I do sometimes during the day, I work at home in my garage, I've insulated my garage. And so 
I, I usually get up in the morning and if it's not too cold, I go for a walk and a run outside. And then I've got a um, treadmill in my garage. Uh, you know, I saved up and bought a tread, treadmill because I know how good it is for me to exercise, right? So uh, in between meetings on Zoom, I turn it on and, I, and I'll walk for a minute or two and then I'll run for two minutes and then I'm done because I've already had my other run. So what it's doing is it's doing a lot of stuff, you know, uh, I'll get, I'll talk about that in just a second, but all throughout the day, I continue to move, right? And this pandemic has been good in that way because I don't have to, you know, go to work, you know, with all my work clothes on, I can just, you know, show up like I'm showing up tonight with a nice sweatshirt with my sweatpants on that no one can see in the bottom, right? Got no shoes on, I'm you know, sitting on the bed. Um, but it improves running and that kind of movement improves the brain's executive function. Dancing does the same thing, good hard dancing. And what is the brain's executive function about? Well, it's our ability to delay gratification. You know, if we look at something we have like, oh, I want that piece of cake, oh, I want this or that. You know, when we, as we exercise that, our, our executive function, which is in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, uh, what it does is, is it really helps us to kind of pull back, you know, and say, I don't really need that, right? This is what our ancestors did because, uh, you know, we have, we have, we want to be gratified, all of us do, but gratification comes at a cost and it did with our ancestors because they couldn't go out and just go grab a, you know, something to eat out of the fridge. I mean, they had a, they had a, you know, they had a, um, you know, pace their meals, you know, and, and save their food, right? So um, gratification then became a big part of our genetic history. You know, we, we need things to gratify us, right? Um, and, and, and so if it's not food, it's gotta be movement or song or laughter or whatever it is. Um, avoid distraction, right? Things that distract us, you know, and that, that's, we live in a world that's really become a distracted world because cell phones and all kinds of technology distract us. You know, I, I always tell, tell the people, you know, I say, well, um, when I give this talk, I say, I bet folks are on their cell phone right now, just sort of kind of flipping through while I'm talking, you know, and we all do that, right? But it has a cost to our brain. It really disrupts our ability to focus. And uh, uh, if we want to get well, we want to get healthy, that's one of the key things is to learn how to keep quiet our brain down so our brain begins to um, heal and, and stops firing. The other thing it improves is our, what they call our cognitive, our brain's flexibility, our ability to move from one uh, cognitive task to the next. You know, one thing, one demand that we have in front of us, we can work on it and then someone can pull it away from us and then we can stop for a second and go then go on to the next task because the brain is kind of, kind of in this flow movement, right? And that's a difficulty then when people are traumatized or have addictions or um, you know, um, get stuck in one kind of way of, of functioning all the time. Uh, and that's why diversity is good. Uh, running increases our, uh, what they call BDNF, the brain derived neurotrophic factor. You don't have to remember any of these, but just remember that this BDNF, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I study a lot of neuroscience. How do I remember that? You know, cause I don't know all these terms. So I, when I was first learning brain derived neurotrophic factor, I would think, well, how can I remember that term that as an acronym for what? So I'd say to myself, big darn native fella. That's how I can remember that. Because I, when I go for a run, the, the, the BDNF uh, uh, in my brain increases. So it's like, I imagine when I'm running that there's this big darn native fella with a big bucket of, of uh, BDNF pouring it on my brain and my brain's growing as I run and I'm developing um, what they call cognitive reserve. You're growing more and more brain, brain cells to protect your brain from things like Alzheimer's disease, from dementia, you know, for, uh, to call upon when you need more brain cells for memory and so on. Uh, and this is what our ancestors did, right? That's why our ancestors had such great memories and um, they hardly got Alzheimer's disease, you know, um, even, even the ones that lived for old age. So the BDNF grows, it grows, it's miracle growth for the brain. Uh, it initiates LTP, which is another is long-term potentiation, right? So what that means is that as we do something, as we, as we scroll through our, our phone with one finger like this, with one digit, you know, uh, the more and more we do that, and the more and more we see um, things on our cell phone, or we sit at our computers and type, um, the, the, our brain wires that in so that after a while you can type, you know, uh, with your thumbs very easily and you'll know exactly where the keys are because the brain has wired together these different neurons and they're firing together. So it gets stronger and stronger. Pretty soon you can, 
do it without looking, you know. So that's how the brain works. So the last one I really wanted to talk about was this um, uh, exercise, right? This is something, you know, that's fairly, fairly new um, in terms of the research. We know now that studies are, 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 you know, revealing that exercise is very, very, has a very, very strong protective factor, you know. I mean, uh, any, any rehab center, any clinic or any uh, trauma or any and besides a gym should have treadmills for their clients or the people to walk on and to exercise on. Don't just go to the jail. I mean, and um, why? Because exercise protects us from depression, you know, by increasing the skeletal muscle. And this is caririnine aminotransferase. But just remember that it increases our skeletal muscle cat expression. So once that we, we start running and exercising and our heart rate goes up and we're breathing and are walking fast or whatever it is, um, it begins to um, shift away this caririnine uh, metabolism from this, uh, we have this neurotoxic KYNA caririnine in our bodies. When we sit around, when we don't exercise, we don't move, that builds up in our body, that, that uh, neurotoxin. And um, running actually then uh, helps neutralize that and it turns that neurotoxin into this particular curinetic acid, KYNA. So, wow, we didn't, we didn't realize how important exercise was then and running was. And then when you look at hunter-gatherer populations or any, almost anyone who runs, you're gonna find that they have much lower levels of anxiety, trauma, depression. And you look at cultures around the world that are running cultures, indigenous cultures that run, that exercise, that move a lot, you're gonna see uh, significantly less, significantly less depression and anxiety disorders, mood disorders among these, these folks. So if you look at this guy out in the desert running here, that's what I'm talking about is that today we have this, you know, something so simple we can um, we can begin to kind of turn the clock back and again it's very indigenous and very traditional because it's our part of our heritage uh what we what we i call it now is we have movement deficit disorder right we don't move enough um here's a, here's another uh, one when i mentioned uh, dancing remember i mentioned dancing dancing is uh, the idea that you know um uh, you know it's an expression of culture right? just like singing is so this particular study sh was uh, showing that singing, you know, and, and uh, increases these levels of endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are kind of like, think of it you know, as marijuana in your brain, right? I mean, it's not, it's a very different kind of, it's similar. It's a uh, kind of opioid kind of expression in your brain that, you know, reduces stress and anxiety, enhances your memory, protects your brain and reduces pain and makes you feel good, right? And so when you, when you, um, when you dance and you, and you, in this particular, um, um, let's say you're out, you're out in a boat, you're really, you're really out there in a boat, you know, um, out in the ocean or the open water, really uh, paddling, same thing, right? It's good. It's the same thing as dancing or cycling. It's about getting your heart rate up and, and releasing those endocannabinoids. It has uh, uh, really positive effects. Singing, most beneficial activity in this particular study. And of course, why is singing is so important? Because what it does, again, is raise endocannabinoids. Most people, they're singing, they're singing a song that they love and the song has meaning to them. The song may have humor in it, may tell a story, whatever, whatever it does. So if you remember that, you know, um, we should all be singing, you know, every day we should be singing, singing songs. We should all be dancing, you know, every day because this, as we, as we do this, you know, there's these, they call novel signaling messengers, you know, from this biochemical evidence that show that, as I said earlier, when we dance and when we sing and when we run, it protects our brain, improves our mood, takes away the anxiety and depression, reduces stress and enhances, you know, uh, all our different kinds of brain functions and so on. So very important. Again, now there you go got running, now you've got singing, now you've got dancing. The studies are showing over and over again that these traditional practices are going to improve the way our brain work, improve our memory. If you want to remember your language, be a good speaker. You know, I, this is what I would tell people, you know, uh, practice your language, 
and then uh, go for a little two minute run or come back or do something for two minutes, get your blood, get your blood raised and your heart rate raised and come back. That will kind of help lock in words and phrases and, and, and uh, those kinds of things into the brain, right? Uh, because again, you're, you're producing more uh, cell, uh, neural uh, um, cell growth. Laughter. Now we can't, and we shouldn't underestimate, you know, the um, effects of laughter on our brain health. And, and what we know now is that humor is really in our genetics. It's in our genetic profile. And um, it, it comes down to DNA differences. So right? some people can barely smile at jokes and, and other people just, you know, crack up and laugh and snort, you know, and, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, I'm, my family's like that. I, the community I come from are, are people that love to laugh. They love humor. They love to tease. They love to tell funny stories. When they're posting on Facebook, you, you can tell they have these funny memes and all these different kinds of things. I've been watching how people in, in the, in the um, CNN, uh, you know, kind of was doing a poll on all these different groups, you know, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, and then something else, right? So all these indigenous people are kind of laughing, calling themselves, well, we're no longer indigenous people, we're something else, right? That's what CNN calls us. And they made all kinds of jokes about it. And so, I mean, that's the thing is that it's in our DNA, right? So when you, when you think about it, if you're thinking about, you know, your work as a counselor or a trauma specialist or a healer or, you know, a leader in your community, laughter is very, very important. Humor is very important, especially for people who have these, this genetic uh, variants called, they're, they're, or short alleles, right? And this gene, this particular gene here, it's also called a serotonin transporter gene. These are the people that are going to laugh more, they're going to smile more, they're going to, you know, chuckle more, they're going to you know, um, want to engage in more storytelling that's funny or pranks or, you know, a tease and that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's there in the DNA, right? And what we know is that people who have the funny bone gene with the short alleles flourish in a positive environment where there's a lot of smiles, a lot of laughter, a lot of teasing and so on, right? So it's very appropriate, right? Because it's in the DNA. You put them in a negative uh, one where there's not, there's not, you know, it's all serious, it's all business, right? Don't smile, don't laugh. That's you've got to be serious. That's a negative environment for people with this genetic um, uh, profile, and they're going to suffer, right? The people with long alleles, uh, interestingly enough, are people from uh, um, um, uh, Western or um, uh, yeah, Western and Northern European groups, you know, especially Western European groups have longer alleles, so they're less sensitive to environmental conditions where there's no, not a lot of laughter, right? So they're, they don't need laughter in a sense, you know, they'll, you know, if you notice that they'll maybe smile or whatever, but that doesn't mean, you know, like white people are not, you know, uh, don't have a sense of humor um, and, and indigenous people do. It, it means that, you know, both do, but it, they just have different frequencies of, of uh, this particular gene where they would, some will laugh more and some will, you know, uh, laugh less or, or so on. So you may have funny indigenous people and you may have some very serious ones that, you know, I was, you know, that, that, you know, don't, you know, have a time to laugh or whatever. Same thing with, with uh, non-indigenous people. So what's really interesting about this gene, this funny bone gene, I call it, is that it is found in uh, collectivist cultures too, you know? So you've got the same gene here. See this funny bone gene here makes you laugh. It's also in this uh, um, uh, group here that are collectivists. So they've got this gene here because they're in a group. They've got this gene here because they have humor. So that's why you'll see a lot of people get together and they just laugh and they giggle and tell funny stories, right? Not all groups do that. Some, you know, a lot of, some groups do that, but you're gonna find more frequencies of you know, people with this particular gene. And again, collectivist cultures are indigenous cultures generally. Uh, sleep, right? Um, what we know about sleep is that we need, you know, um, you know, sleep, and and we don't get enough sleep, you know, our our molecular clock inside of us that keeps, uh, you know, synced with the sun and the moon and, and and the rising and falling of the sun, and like light and dark, you know, uh, our our clock breaks when 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 we don't keep in sync with it, and it increases our risk for illnesses, diabetes, heart disease, and dementia. You know, our brain actually shrinks when we don't get enough sleep. This is one of the things that's so different about our ancestors and us is they got enough sleep. 
they didn't they weren't colonized by cell phones or you know um, tablets or you know computers or televisions and and this floodlight society right that we all the lights are on all the time we know that sleep sleep is crucial for childhood development it's also very crucial for you know us as we age too and poor sleep is linked to you know learning disabilities to trauma to anxiety disorders and so on sleep is so important because growth hormones human growth hormones that give us muscle that give us you know strength and so on and help keep us strong are released you know when we sleep and also infection fighting proteins so that's why when you see people that don't get enough sleep they're going to they're going to end up with a lot of infections during the year colds and that sort of thing and they're they're very vulnerable you know they've really taxed themselves out um, the one thing about sleep I'll say that I think is very important for folks to know is that when we go to sleep at night, as we get older, even when you're younger, you know, the same holes that our body builds up um, during the day, uh, molecular waste, and it, some of it gets into our brain. It goes, past, it goes past what they call the brain's blood barrier, gets past that and gets into our brain. And one of those proteins that does it is it are called um, amyloid proteins. Amyloid proteins are, are kind of one of the hallmarks of, of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, but that's not the problem. We all get those. The problem is if we don't sleep well, our brain, you know, um, actually releases uh, uh, chem chemicals that sweep and clean out our brain at night when we get, we get into deep le deeper levels of sleep. When we don't sleep, we leave more and more amyloid proteins in the brain and eventually we'll get, to, we'll get Alzheimer's disease. Our brain has its own uh, lymphatic system where it drains out the molecular junk from the brain, it cleans out the brain. So this is the, um, this is the, the, the you know, uh, very important sleep, right? Again, you know, it's, it's not something, if, if you're social workers, that's what I work with social workers or counselors, you know, this is an assessment right, tool, right? How many times did you run this week or move this week and get your heart rate up to you check the box off and how many times and, and how many times did you dance this week? Uh, you know, how many times did you sing to yourself this week or sing for others this week? How many times, you know, or how well did you sleep last night? Right. How well did you sleep? Right. And, and these are things that, you know, we can check off and, and I can, I can, uh, um, I, I believe that, you know, as we do these things, we're going to see really the health of people rise, you know, memory is going to rise, arise and get better. You know, our ability to focus and concentrate gets better. Our ability to recover from trauma is going to get better. Our health is going to get better all the way around. This is the circadian rhythm clock here. So just a quick look at that. Generally, you know, we, we wake up sometime around here, maybe, um, you know, some people wake up a little earlier. I'm kind of a person that can wake up, you know, anytime right around here. But one of the things, you know, is when we wake up, our melatonin, you know, which is the, you know, the chemical that helps us sleep, melatonin makes us drowsy. But in order to really turn that melatonin clock off, so you're not drowsy during the day, is you're going to start your day by getting some sun, right? If you don't have sun at certain times of the year, then it's important to do things, right? And now we know that because we've intermarried and we got some genes from people that, you know, probably um, are more affected by the absence of, of uh, sunlight and get more, you know, seasonal affective disorder and depression. You know, we have to, we have to get these sad lights, you know, that people sit under. So what's, what's important then about this is that when, once you get some sunlight, you know, you shut off that melatonin clock and then you see like these high levels of alertness and best coordination and fast reaction time happening here. These are the times and the places you want to, you know, be doing the stuff you need to do at your best, right? Uh, if you're taking some kind of medicine, you want to take it, you know, somewhere in here when, you know, your uh, cells and uh, your, gen your genes are sort of expressing for that and, and it takes in the medicine. That way you don't have to take double, you know, triple doses or whatever, right? That's just some new information that, you know, folks have been learning. Limiting caffeine, start dimming lights at, you know, maybe about eight o'clock. Not me, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm up at right now. Our time is uh, 10.55 here and limit uh, technology use. Then your melatonin starts midnight. And this is where you start, you know, getting your restorative sleep, your deep sleep, you know, where you get into really nice, big, deep breaths. Your heart rate slows down. Your REM sleep, of course, you're dreaming. And then, you know, these are kind of, it's a teaching time. And then you're, again, you're, you're, it starts over. But the idea is that 
sleep is very important and all you know life that we know of from you know these really small microbial life to you know big animals and trees and plants and oceans and everything has a circadian rhythm hour clock and it functions you know sometimes it's on 24 hours sometimes it's 24 and a half sometimes it's 23 and a half so our our, our rhythms are, are are created you know inside of us according to what we eat how we think if we go to sleep we turn off the lights and those kinds of things but they're also uh, you know they're also affected by you know, different kinds of things that happen outside of us, like, you know, too much sun or too much sunlight coming in or, you know, the temperature's too hot, too cold or whatever. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's in all of us. And again, look at this uh, last bullet point here, patterns of brain wave activity, you know, uh, hormone production, cell regeneration, all these really important biological activities are linked to the daily cycle, which is why, you know, at night, you know, people would go to bed when, when it got dark and they would get up when it got light, right? We start having some artificial lights at some point, you know, we use kerosene or seal oil or you know, um, some um, oil, you know, fish oil or different kinds of things, you know, to burn, you know, um, but generally our ancestors didn't, you know, they, they had fires and that kind of thing, but we lived in that state for, you know, millions of years. And that's why, you know, the circadian rhythms are very important. I won't, let's see. Um, the heat shock proteins. Um, this is what's produced, you know, um, HSP, heat shock proteins. We don't have to know much about them, but what we do need to know is that they are really important in terms of what they call protein folding. We all have proteins, you know, in our body, you know, that are in different parts of our body that help us, you know, um, you know, um, it's an indicator how, you know, how well our protein structures are, you know, our, our longevity and our, and our wellness and that sort of thing. And um, as we get older, or as we are in trauma or stressed, you know, or if we don't eat right, we don't sleep right, we, our heat, uh, our uh, protein uh, folding can, you know, our proteins can be misfolded, which will lead to, um, uh, you know, disease. But what our people did at one time is they sat in ice cold pools, you know, for spiritual reasons and so on, or they sat in really hot places like, you know, sweat lodges and so on. But when you challenge your body, and this is what the part I call adaptive stress, when you challenge your body and your body has to deal with an ice cold shower in the morning or you deal with a really hot sauna, you know, or a hot sweat lodge, you know, um, uh, so many times a week, your body then begins to produce these heat shock proteins, you know, that are in your cells that, you know, are now found to be a, a sign of longevity, disease protection, healthy skeletal muscles, you know, uh, and wellness, right? Again, another thing, if you were interviewing somebody and said, well, how many times did you uh, take a cold shower this week, right? How many times did you sit in a hot sauna, right? I mean, those are things that, you know, you may, someone that we may be using in the future to kind of, uh, to uh, spur people on to, uh, you know, better health and well-being. Uh, I mentioned fasting, and I, I won't talk too much about it, but the idea that, you know, uh, in intermittent fasting, which is kind of big, you know, um, with a lot of people now, you know, people go and they, they fast for periods of time from food, not they don't eat, you know, all day long and, you know, or late at night and so on, because our genetics, uh, for many of us, um, it's very, it hangs on to food. If you are someone who puts on weight easily, or if you know people that, you know, even exercise and they're still, they're still uh, heavy and, and they, they change their diet, the idea is, is the metabolism does slow down, but it's a genetic slowdown too as well. That means that you know um, your body's getting ready for the next starvation period. That's how we evolved, right? That's why um, we evolved to to put on weight, and and you know very quickly and to maintain it because you know you could you could put it on in, in two weeks or whatever or a month or two, and then all of a sudden the the the, the uh, starvation period came on. So you you would, if you were the person that is heavy right now, or you know people that are heavy, these are the people generally that are that would survive you know, the uh, famines and the starvation periods. But now we're trying to replicate that in, in an intermittent fasting protocol, just having people fast from food you know, for um, 16 to 18 hours a day and, have, and, and only eat between uh, six and eight hours during the day. And you find out that you know, people lose weight and, and uh, have better um, outcomes. This is, this is one of the reasons uh, we evolved to fast 
you know, something like I said, it's a it's kind of a dying art and a dying science and a dying practice. But this particular Jesuit man, uh, missionary, this Paul June, was among these uh, Montanay um, Indian hunter gatherers in Canada, 1636, and he was with them. He was very hungry. They haven't eaten for some days, right? And he was like, you know, he was watching them as they were still doing their work, right? And he was writing in his journal. He said, I saw them in their hardships and labor suffer with cheerfulness. Found himself, you know, found himself to threatened with great suffering right? and hunger. And they said, they, they said, they talked to him. He said, we shall be sometimes two days, sometimes three days uh, without eating for lack of food. They're telling him, you know, take courage, Chinini. Let thy soul to be strong to endure suffering and hardship. I mean, they're telling this, you know, this priest that, right? Keep thyself from being sad, otherwise thou wilt be sick. Even, or uh, see how we do not cease to laugh, even though we have little to eat. Well, most of us won't laugh at hunger because we have, we get hangry, right? We, we, we don't live like our ancestors did. But here you have two things coming together, three things coming together. You've got collectivist people in this particular tribe still doing their work and, and their labor and they're still, you know, this, so that, that's the collectivist gene expressing. Then you've, they've got the laughter. He's talking about the laughter, right? They're laughing while they're hungry and they're doing their work and teasing and so on. They haven't eaten for three days, four days, whatever. They're still laughing and teasing. So that's a protective factor. Why? Because as they, as they uh, laugh and they tease and they're together in a group, they're getting a strong genetic expression that's protecting them. They're raising the brain-derived neurotrophic factor in their brain and so on until they can, so they can hunt better, so they can gather better, they can see food or whatever it is, or find food. So it's all working in their advantage, even though they're very hungry. Um, the third uh, uh, part of the genetic expression then, besides the, um, the fasting, or I mean, besides the um, um, hunger and, and the laughter, then is the idea that they, um, you know, um, the body then, is, under, is now in a state of fasting. So then it's gonna do the same thing as the dancing, right? It's gonna, it's gonna raise the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the opioid, you know, pain uh, uh, um, killers are gonna uh, go on and mood's gonna improve, all those kinds of things, right? And if we, if we live like that, you know, that's, that's how we uh, find ourselves, um, uh, um, you know, in that state. So what are the benefits? You know, these are just some of the benefits, right? There's a lot of diabetes, so it improves our, you know, uh, glucose regulation. We lose abdominal fat, you know, when we maintain our muscle mass, blood pressure goes down. We have a heart rate variability, you know, that your heart speeds up when it needs to slow down when it needs to, you know, really well, like a well-trained athlete. Uh, learning and memory uh, and motor functions all improve and, and they improve with running. They improve with dancing, they improve with singing, they improve with sitting in hot, you know, um, um, places they improve with, you know, uh, sleeping, right? So these are all things that are improving our well-being. Besides, and fasting is right in there. Fasting also protects, you know, neurons uh, in the brain from all these other, these diseases. And, and um, here's, here's the really important part, is that when we fast, when our ancestors fasted, it was beneficial for their health because it imposed a challenge to their cells in their body. You know, their cells was like, oh, there's no food. You know, what am I going to do? You know, and as they, as they, as you kind of starve them a bit, they get stronger, they adapt and they can, then it, they help us cope with stress and resist disease. Right. And that's all the cells in our body and our brain. So these are very traditional kinds of things that are happening. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this last slide here. Uh, generally, I talk a little bit about uh, mindfulness meditation, but I'll stop here. Um, uh, th this is the last thing to know, that in our brains, the front part of our brain, this is the underside of the brain between the two hemispheres here, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. That is, I, I, again, not a, not a neuroscientist, so I call it the very mad private first class, right? And why do I call it that? Because I call it the very mad private first class because this part of the brain is in the under, this part of the activity happens on the other side of our brain where our brain, you know, is holding up all the trauma and all the stress and whatever. So I imagine that, you know, it's, it's lighting up, getting angry, right? But it's really doing good stuff. And this is what happens when we're, when we're coping, uh, you know, resiliently 
And when we're not, we don't have activation there. So we have activation in all different parts of the brain too, or other parts, but the major activation you see is happening here. So cognitive resilience then is our ability to overcome negative effects or, uh, or stress on our brain's function. Our brain doesn't just work alone, it works with the whole body. What we know um, is this, prior experience and training to deal with high levels of stress and uncertainty does, and I said, it says may, but we know now it does improve cognitive resilience. So now we, people talk about resilience, resilience. Now we know where it happens. It happens in this, this part of the brain, the VF, VMPFC. We know now that training to deal with high levels of stress and uncertainty uh, come in many, many uh, forms, in many, many indigenous cultures. When young people were trained, you know, to uh, train their awareness, their attention um, by focusing on something, you know, like I remember um, I was talking with some Yupik folks about how, um, when I was in Alaska, uh, how young boys would be taken away to, to live with the men and, and they would, you know, be trained to kind of watch a blowhole for several hours, you know, for the seals coming up. But all cultures have kind of done that. I, I, you know, with the, with the young men and young women, they've, they've trained them, you know, uh, you know, you're going to have to go without food at some time. You're going to have to, you know, deal with cold sometime. You're going to have to deal with this or that kind of thing. So you're training people. Um, uh, the quick story I'll tell you is when I was uh, in Northern California in Yurok and Wiat and Hoopa territory, um, I was, a, you know, a visitor there. I was a professor at Humboldt State University. I had a chance to talk with U, uh, U, uh, Yurok elders and, and intellectuals, and they told me stories about how their rites of passage for their young people, uh, help them, you know, uh, train to, to deal with high levels of stress and challenge. One of the things that they did is they had these young people waiting on, this is, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, when they had the young people run up into the mountains, you know, with just their grass skirts on and their headbands and the prayer stick and feathers at night. When, it, you know, if in Northern California, it's cold, the mountains are cold up there. So they run up there at night you know, young, you know, maybe 20 young men, 20 young women at a time, they run up and they sing and they, you know, they, they have to deal with the, the fact that there are grizzly bears up in the mountains and mountain lions up there, but also mountain spirits, right? So they run through there. Every time they run through, you know, the levels of stress and uncertainty, you know, they get stronger from that, right? They also did open ocean swimming where they swam from like in really cold waters in Northern California from the shore out to a point, maybe 300 meters offshore, then back again. Well, the water is very cold. That's the first thing. Secondly, the uncertainty was, you know, there's great white sharks in the water. So they had to deal with that uncertainty. So um, when you look at this part of the brain, then um, resilient coping, coping happens then um, when you're challenged, you know, like you fast or you're, you're challenged to run or you're challenged to sit in a hot or very cold environment. Um, it, it, it's located in this prefrontal cortex in, in the brains of mammals and also in the frontal lobes, the side left and, and right side of the uh, hemispheres. So what is it implicated in? The processing of risk and fear. It helps us process risk and fear and helps us take control of that. It also plays a role in the inhibition of uh, emotional responses, learning how to like have your emotions under control, right? So you don't yell out or scream or, or you know, get overexcited or whatever. This, you know, all that training that you were doing with young people help them uh, control their emotional responses, help them with their decision-making and self-control, right? With their willpower. And finally, um, the last thing it did was uh, create um, a sense, it's implicated in a sense of morality, right? Evaluation of morality. So when I talk to these uh, folks, these um, um, indigenous people from Northern California, that's one of the things I learned after reading an article about, you know, the, the people that went through this, uh, these, uh, this training, right, these rites of passage. And it wasn't like just one week and it was like over a period of time, you know, different, you know, for years. It wasn't every day, but they, they had to get ready for it and they had to practice for it and do these uh, ceremonial runs and swims, you know, without food and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and in the end, uh, as I was reading this anthropological article about it, I found out that, you know, um, these people who had gone through this process uh, ended up, you know, being, according to this anthropologist, some of the most, had, having the highest level of ethics and morality and courage 
and they were the, you know like very helpful to other members of, of the tribe and, and village and you know they were seen as you know this having this really exemplary uh, behavior right so um these are all things that i i'm looking at right now in terms of the research that i'm doing and um i'm gonna stop sharing here and um i think these things are like you know these are things we did as indigenous people for thousands of years never had to write a government grant for these things right they were just there they were just there and and we uh did those science things but we, we find out that this is good for all populations for everybody to do these kinds of things singing dancing sleeping well exercise but for uh for uh, most people we don't think about it much in terms of um uh, you know, as a healing modality, as a healing approach right now, we think about, you know, other kinds of things. So I, I do this research and I talk about this as a way to kind of, uh, you know, say this, these are things we can in integrate, you know, our, our work with people, you know, our the clients, our patients, or the, you know, the people we work with, you know, uh, folks we counsel or we work with, you know, we can, we can use these as complementary uh, forms. Terms of, of help. So I'm just going to stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to take a brief moment to uh, acknowledge uh, your gifts that you gave to us uh, today. Normally we would have you uh, in our homeland, in our ancestral territory, we'd, we'd give you some fish, we'd give you some, some goodies from here. Uh, but for now, I'll just respond with some words. Uh, thank you for giving us some of your wisdom and sharing with us here. Uh, it's amazing to, to hear the way that you think about things. And uh, it leads me to just think I had an elder who used to call me sometimes right before I go to teach our language and she'd say, you guys are going out to soak in that icy water. You got to get yourselves ready. And so it's so relevant to the work that we're doing. And I want to thank you for sharing with us. Uh, for those of you who are uh, watching, you can feel free to uh, unmute yourself to ask a question, or you can type it into the chat, whichever you are most comfortable with. Uh, we have about 20 more minutes to share with our guest. I know we're keeping them up past the, uh, past the when, when everything's supposed to start be winding down, but uh, thank you so much for hanging with us. And uh, anybody have any questions or things you'd like to talk about? Yeah, as, as you're getting your questions ready, I just want to say it was my pleasure. I'm really um, always glad to, to share this work that I'm doing, and I'm, I'm, I'm just very, um, very excited about it, very encouraged by it. And I know that, you know, we have within, uh, you know, within our, within our ability to, to change, you know, gen and within a generation, you know, we can, we can uh, change health and well-being, you know, that quickly, right? And, um, yeah, it's very, so... One of our colleagues here who, uh, who teaches and studies our language, she talks to us, Shchak, uh, Alice Taff, about like how when you learn your, uh, your indigenous language, even if, it, even if it's your ancestral language, you have to literally burn these new pathways into your mind. And, and how does that relate to uh, these things you're talking about here? Well, I, I, again, you know, um, I think, you know, Practice is always one of the things, you know, that's what neuroplasticity is all about. Practice, practice, practice. But how to enhance the practice, I think, is, is really important. Uh, there's some research that shows that, um, that you know, uh, when a person, let's say, goes for, does exercise and comes back and, and performs on a test or a task, let's say you're given a language test and, uh, you know, you go out and you, you exercise and, and um, or you dance or you get your heart rate up for, you know, 10 minutes or 20 minutes or even five minutes or two minutes even, uh, your, your performance is better, you know, whether it's language, whether it's memory, recall, those things improve. And, and you know, the simple reason is that 
when you do them, you, you do produce more brain cells. And, it, and what it does is that a lot of those brain cells don't last a long time because unless you do it a lot, then they start you getting reserved. But they go to the, the places where you need it the most. And evolutionarily, where we need it the most is in our memory. So we could remember where food was, how to communicate, how to watch out for danger, how to be aware. And that's the first place that you know, we're going to send our, uh, those, those new brain cells to is our memory memory. So that's why when people do tasks, they do math problems or learn language, you know, if you do um, exercise, you know, before a test, you're going to find out that you're going to do better on that. And then when you do it all the time, you begin to slowly lock those in even more, because then you start getting your reserve, right? Just like when you talked about sitting in cold water, that's also going to activate brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and it's going to activate the, the, the growth of new neurons in the brain. So if you do those things, plus you sleep well and you dance and you sing and you tease, you know, all those kinds of things, you will, you know, I can guarantee you, you're going to be growing, you're going to be having a, you know, a burst of, of growth in the brain. That's what all the research shows. So. Uh, I, I'm going to take this as permission to keep teasing my students. So uh, we had another question, which was, uh, how about mindfulness and meditation? How does that balance with the physical activity and also with the, the heat and the cold? You know, uh, it, mindfulness is, is, you know, the basic practice of, of, of sitting and training yourself, you know, to, to focus and to come back to a, a place all the time, you know, come back to the focus. It's, if it's your breath, you're watching your breath go in, you're watching your breath go out. Thoughts are going to come up, your mind's going to run all over the place. But the more you practice that, and sometimes you can even use um, an anchor and say, you breathe in, you'll say, uh, you know, um, you can say, just count one, two, watch your breath, you know, and then, you know, you get less distraction from memories, but the more and more you do it, after a while, your brain quiets down. And again, you know, you learn how to use the maximum amount of concentration as you move from one task to the next. It improves recall, it improves, you know, memory, it improves, you know, your ability to uh, reason, and to uh, decipher and analyze issues and problems, memory included, language included. It's all about memory, right? Uh, I've seen some research where, um, let's say you go for a run or you, you go out and you get in a, in a canoe or a boat and you paddle really hard for 20 minutes or you, you know, go for a fast walk or something, you know, get your, or you dance, you get your heart rate up. You know, I've seen all of those uh, Alaska native dances, boy, they really dance hard, some of those folks, you know, and I said, man, they're, Heart rates are up and, you know, the brain and neurons are firing. Uh, the research shows that, you know, when people do that and then they sit quietly for five minutes, it helps preserve some of that brain there. It, it doesn't just come and go right away. You know, it does for a lot of us, you know, but uh, and that's why when you when you dance and you sing at the same time or you run at the same time, same time, it, it sort of supercharges your memory so that you're going to you're going to learn the song quicker. You're going to learn the language quicker if you if you if you're running and you're practicing your words as you run or you paddle or you get or you dance. That in itself is going to improve, you know, the um, activation of, of uh, new neuron growth again to the memory. So mindfulness does the same thing. Mindfulness quiets the uh, circuits and you focus and your ability to take in more um, more information improves. So. Excellent. Uh, anybody else, a thought or a question? I see, I see, I see a comment from uh, Maka says, not a question, but tonight it was like this. Michael talks about numerous benefits of fasting. Me freezes with a slice of pizza in the hallway in my mouth. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, it's, you know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's something, you know, uh, you know, we just take note of, right. We just take note of, and, and we start practicing and, and using those kinds of things. Yeah. So um, it's, it's really, um, someone looks like Sid said, a friend and I did a full moon plunge on Halloween, freezing water, but you, you felt better afterward. Yeah. Very cool. How uh, healing it is. And what happens again, um, Sid, is that, you know, not only do you, does your, your blood move from kind of inside to kind of to the outside of your, your body, but 
you know, what you're experiencing are, 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 is kind of a burst of um, endocannabinoids in your brain. You know, it's like, whoa, that's cold, right? So your brain, in order to your body to preserve itself, it releases endocannabinoids in your brain to deal with the pain of that cold, right? And then, and then when you get out of that, the endocannabinoids are still active, right? So you feel kind of a little high, right? I mean, you feel good. And, and that's it really it is, that's, it's, a, it's a neurochemical reaction. That's why people did what they did. You know, they, they, they run or they sit in cold things, they get out, they feel really good. They're like, oh, I feel great. Well, the endocannabinoids have kicked in. So it's, it's, a, you know, it, it's an ancient kind of thing. That's why we do what we do, right? Before we had uh, anxiety and, and you know, um, you know, antidepressants and those kinds of things, you know, that's, that was our natural, you know, antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication was, you know, to, to use a natural source, like sitting in an ice cold pool for, you know, a bit. So, I mean, if you're interested, you know, there's a lot of research on that right now. I mean, not that it's anything new, indigenous people have been doing that forever, right? But now it's become this hot bed of research, like take a sh cold shower, you know, for five minutes every day and you're gonna see all these really dynamic improvements in health and so on. And uh, you do, you know, so. Excellent. I, and I know the, the plunge is great, but when when we were taught, you were supposed to go in very slow, very deliberate when you're getting into that cold water. And I know the, the sweat lodge is something that's kind of vanished from our territory, but I, I do think those two things used to really go hand in hand was the, the sweat lodge which was maybe not as ceremonial as in, in other parts of um, Turtle Island, as you say. But I know that the going into the cold water, like that was something, it was a very deliberate thing. You're singing, you're praying, you're helping each other out. And sometimes it's 10 degrees, 20 degrees outside and you're going into the ocean. Or last year we went into a river up in Yakutat. And so, um, yeah, and I know maybe, yeah, I see Sid is, type maybe the plunge is just the term but yeah just in terms of like also that mindfulness is your actions are very deliberate and uh the first time I went in I was kind of laughing because I think that's how I cope with just how uncomfortable it, it was at first and I got kind of scolded for laughing so you I, I we gotta laugh but we also gotta know when we're supposed to be a little bit yeah. more um, yeah reflective. Well, I mean, as I say, the natural thing to laugh, you know, I mean, people say, well, that's inappropriate, you shouldn't laugh, but your body's doing what it needs to do because really when you're laughing, what's it doing? Again, it's releasing endocannabinoids. Your body knows it's gonna be cold, right? Your brain knows it's gonna be cold. So it's a protective factor that kicks in right away, you know, um, and, and so it's very natural, very normal for humans to laugh at, you know, um, their hunger, to laugh at fear, to laugh at something that, you know, is overwhelming to them, like trauma, you know, some people laugh at that, right? And, um, again, and it's not like it's, you know, um, morally or, you know, ethically or, you know, in bad taste. It's just an evolutionary way of coping with, you know, something that can overwhelm us. So it's, um, you know, that's what it's for. That's what, that, you know, that's why we, that's why we evolved to laugh. That's why we evolved to tease. That's why we evolved to tell jokes and have humor, right? Yeah. So what would the world be if you didn't have jokes or humor? I mean, it'd be a pretty sorry place, I think, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. And then I, I guess maybe we got time for one more, which was I saw one, uh, a lot of folks expressing appreciation, but I know someone asked, Maureen Hall asked, is there a recommended reading list for this topic? You know, I, I, um, I have, um, 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 most of um, the work that I'm doing are, are from articles that I pulled pulled together. So, I mean, I keep on promising to finish my book. This is part of my book that I'm trying to finish. I finished wow. two books this year. So this one is next on my list. So I'm really working hard to finish it, you know, with all this information and uh, updating the information, uh, you know, with uh, pictures and, and, you know, links to, you know, look at this stuff. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, a lot of that information is out there. I've just taken the time to collect it, you know, and for the book that I'm doing. So hopefully I'm just hoping within the next, you know, few months, within the year, I'll have a, have a book in hand to finish, you know, and put it on open access so everybody can, you know, download a copy of it. You know, you don't have to spend 200. My last publisher, we just published a book, a colleague and I, 
um, calling, uh, you know, decolonizing uh, pathways to, you know, integrative healing and social work. And uh, we, we did it with a, a mainstream press and the book turned out to be $190. I'm like, wow, you know, who can afford that? You know, so um, my co-author and I were like, okay, we've got to get an open access so people can, you know, download it for free, right? Um, you know, because we're not into, you know, we're not, you know, it's, it's, that's why we're, that's why we write to get, to get this information out to people, right? So, because, the, you know, the press, the, 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 uh, the um, you know, the publishing houses get, you know, like 99% of the, all the profit, right? And, and, and the authors get like 1%, you get like a, you know, if I get, if I get like royalties off a book, I'll be like, well, you got another twenty dollars, you know, in the last quarter, you know, and you sold, you know, twenty thousand books or whatever, you know, you get, you know, like a penny a book or something, <laughs> you know. I mean, this is academic. We're we're not in the world of, you know, the, you know, New York Times bestsellers or anything like that. Or, but uh, that's how it works. So hopefully, I, you know, like I said, I'm going to try to get this thing done in the next several months, and and uh, hopefully uh, it'll be well received. So. Well, this, this was so good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to have stayed up this late, you know, almost 11.30 here at night. So, plus I still got to turn the TV back on to see what, what uh, Joe Biden said, right? So. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Well, goodness, she claims to cut you on. Oh, I see it. There's a hand up. Does somebody want to say one last thing? I see Nicole, you have a hand up. Did you want to? Oh, yeah, it's okay. Um. Yeah, I, I see the time's running out and I think my kids just got here. I, you know, I was just going to ask, like, you know, all of this knowledge is so great about the mindfulness, the running, um, you know, the circadian rhythm and getting your sleep, how the importance of sleep and all that. But when it comes to applying that to your, to your life and, um, and also, I'm, I'm, wait, quiet, please, quiet. And also, um, you know, a lot of indigenous people are in the thick of it. A lot of indigenous people are, you know, in survival mode, right? And I just, I'm thinking of the most vulnerable people in our community and how do you, what, do you have any tips for, um, you know, spreading the message, I guess? It, I don't know if that's, that's a I mean, tough question. I mean, you know, answer. if you can get people on Zoom, people are doing all kinds of things on Zoom, right? The people are put on some music and have everybody dance for 20 minutes, you know, and then talk about it, right? Let's get them, or just get a group sing along or something, you know, or whatever. I mean, those are really fundamental things. I mean, tell people say, dance, just dance today, you know, just, just put on some music and dance, you know, and, and uh, do that for, you know, three times a week, you know, for 10 minutes, you know, those kinds of things, right, are, are really important, you know. Uh, Shut off all your lights at this time every night. You know, close out your windows so it's all dark. And and uh, you know, um, those those are very simple things you can do, right? Uh, go for a walk. You know, um, do different. Those are you know really simple kinds of things you can do. Uh, you know, call up your friend and, and tell jokes, or get on get on a Zoom call and just tell the nastiest, craziest jokes you can tell, right? Tell tell you know tell funny stories, and you know uh, you know make tell people to laugh. Laugh, laugh, laugh. So there's, you know, you know the science about it now, why you want to do those things, right? And, and I mean, the thing is, you saw those indigenous people in, in 1636, you know, starving and still working hard and suffering under their labor, still laughing, right? I mean, they're activating a very, very important genetic response in their body, which is going to elevate their moods. You know, think about it. You know, who do you want to be around? I like, I love to be around people that love to laugh. You know, and I, when I when I were around people, I always you know do it. My my brother, older brother, used to tell me he said best way to, to leave people. He said the last thing you want to do is you want you want to tell a story so people are laughing as you walk away. They're gonna be you know they're gonna they're gonna feel that right. I mean, don't tell them like how sad you are. Tell them a funny story, you know, or or, or you know joke about yourself. You know, if you got if you're you know strong enough to do that, you know, and tell stories, and then get people to start laughing because it's contagious. I mean, part of my presentation, I show some 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 uh, videos of people laughing and how contagious laughing is. Some people, some some guys, uh, there's a, there's one that I show uh, where a guy's looking at an iPad on the bus, and he's looking at that. He starts laughing, starts giggling. Then he starts laughing and laughing. And pretty soon, everyone around him, they're looking at him. And pretty soon, they start giggling. Pretty soon, they're all laughing. They have they have no 
they have no knowledge of what he's laughing about. I mean, it could be a very bizarre thing he's laughing at, but they just see him laughing pretty soon. The whole bus is laughing, right? That's how contagious humor is, right? And that's why it's important to, to, to share that with people. I mean, if you, if you have that, you know, even if you don't have it, you know, practice it, practice humor, practice laughing. Say, did you dance today? Or tell, you know, um, some of my friends on Facebook, you know, they're, they're therapists and every now and then they do like noon, they do noon uh, power dancing and they do these crazy dances, sitting there watching them dance and it's really funny, right? And, um, or, or, you know, they sing or they do these different kinds of things. So I, I think, you know, that's, that's some of the things that I could suggest, you know, just, you know, just treat it like it's a normal time, you know, do the dance, do the laughter, tell funny stories. Okay, goodness cheese. Uh, this presentation uh, is recorded. So folks can, you can share it, you can revisit it. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and, and just say, uh, everyone, you're invited to come participate in our language classes. There's always laughter going on there. There's things that uh, you can't translate to everybody because then they'll know uh, what kinds of things we're up to in there. Uh, but I just wanna say, uh, I'll just close with a few words here as we wrap up. Uh, uh, we have a phrase which is let your spirit be like water where all the sediments have settled and so we hope that you're feeling that we hope that you are living with uh, laughter and love and kindness with the folks that you are with now. And uh, we wanna thank you again, Dr. Yellowbird for spending some time with us. And we hope you get good rest and that we get to see you uh, again very soon. Ganesh Chish, thank you. Thank you everyone, it's my pleasure. Rest well and laugh loud. Yek echa, yek we will. Good night, everybody. Take care.